I am so prepared for this video. I'm sitting in a chair and I replaced the 60 watt light bulb in my lamp with a specialty 150 watt unit. Hello once again everybody. I obtained another vintage computer. At least I call it a vintage computer. It might not be old enough to be classified as that yet. It's a computer that you see before you concealed under this blanket and I obtained it from school and I brought this computer home because it is well for two reasons actually first of all it's a specific type of computer that I've always found very interesting and second of all overall it's just one of the most interesting and oddest computers I've ever seen in my life and I used a computer almost exactly like this in kindergarten in fact it might have been a computer exactly like this so uh, that kind of struck me kind of cool so of course I wanted this thing and I got it but of course like everything else this thing comes with a story of course my uh, first period class in school is an online course I'm taken by the Cisco Networking Academy it's the third Cisco Networking Academy course I'm on now this one is working at an internet service provider it teaches you how to program and configure Cisco routers and uh, basically all the really technical network and stuff that you need to know for working at a medium-sized business or an internet service provider. So, uh, of course, I'm taking this class in the computer lab, and I'm in the computer lab with another class. That class is the tech support class, uh, which are nine kids taking the first Cisco Networking Academy course, which is uh, just your basics, at least. Uh, considering the knowledge I have now, I call it basics, your basics of uh, of maintaining and repairing computers and networks. So anyhow, the teacher who was teaching that class, I teach my class on my own. I'm the only one there, I just read the material online. I heard the teacher tell the tech support class that another teacher had two old computers in his truck. And if anyone wanted to go out and grab those computers, bring them in, format them, and take them if they wanted them, the door to the teacher's truck was open. Well, uh, to my surprise, because usually, you know, normally people love, you know, being able to get up and go out and do something instead of sitting in a chair listening to a teacher, to my surprise, nobody volunteered to get those computers. So, later that day, I said, hey, that teacher that's got those computers, can I go get them? And the computer teacher said, sure. So, I... <sighs> See, for the first time ever, old really meant old. See, I figured these would have been Pentium 4 computers or something. You know, something old by those standards. And I thought, well, probably a couple of Pentium 4 computers. If one of them's perfect working, cool, I get a replacement for the Desk Pro. Assuming that's what they are. So, I went outside. It was pouring rain outside. And I found that teacher's truck. And I opened the lift gate, because it's one of those trucks with the cap on the bed. And I saw two really old computers, a lot older than what I was expecting to see. And one of them was this. This is an MCA Computers, custom built, Turbo 486 computer. This was the first computer of the two that I brought inside. I grabbed this thing in the pouring rain. The cover was only half on it, so the insides and the motherboard got wet as well. And someone had locked the doors into the school while I was on the way back to the school, so I had to come in the front door, and boy, I must have amused some students when I walked in the school soaking wet with this thing under my arm. But uh, yeah, the moment I saw this thing, I knew exactly what it was, and I thought, oh man, I hope this thing works, because I want it. And as a matter of fact, this thing does work absolutely perfectly. So let me get rid of this. Now, if you're subscribed to YouTube user UXW Bill, this thing looks very familiar to you, and so it should. UXW Bill just finished restoring a computer almost exactly like this. There are only a few differences between this one and his, and I'll point those out in the video. So this computer, it has the brand name on it, MCA Personal Computer. And it is my assumption that this was a custom-built, build-to-order computer. I assume, because Googling MCA didn't bring up a thing, 
I assume that MCA made custom build to order computers. People could come in and say what they wanted for a computer and they would build it and, and you could buy it. But despite this being presumably a custom built computer, I know just about everything about this thing. I brought this thing home yesterday and examined it thoroughly. I have not used it yet and I'll show you why in a minute. This computer was made in 1996. This computer has an AMD AM5X86 processor running at 133 megahertz. It has 16 megabytes of RAM and a 1.2 gigabyte hard drive. It has a three and a half inch floppy drive. It has a 10X CD-ROM drive. And yes, that is a turbo button. In addition to a reset button, a power button, and what I thought was a case lock, but it's actually not a case lock. I don't have the key to this computer, but what this lock does is, when it's in the locked position, you cannot use the computer. It does not respond to the keyboard when this is in the lock position. That K there, K lock, that means keyboard lock. So, this is what it looks like, of course. That is an LED display that shows the clock speed of the processor. Now this computer has, as I said a few minutes ago, it is one of the oddest computers I've ever seen. This thing has so many quirks, nothing that's wrong with it, just the way that it works is so darn weird that I just, I gotta show it to you in detail because it's absolutely unreal some of the things about this computer. There was a huge sticker here that I worked very hard to get off. There's still a lot of sticker residue there, as you can see. A little bit of color there. This is physically the biggest computer I've ever owned. It's bigger than the Epson. So here's the model number. It's a 5X133-8-1-1200. Five X one thirty three, of course, denotes the AMD AM five X eighty six hundred thirty three megahertz. Dash eight, I assume, means that it comes with eight megabytes of RAM, and therefore was upgraded to sixteen at some point in its life. I have no clue what dash one means, and the dash twelve hundred means that it has a one point two gigabyte hard drive. And then there's a serial number here. Proudly made in Canada by MCA Computers, Canada, MCA Computers Canada Limited, Markham, Ontario, yay. Here's the power supply, this is not an ATX standard computer, this is in fact an AT standard computer. And as you can see, it's one of these awesome power supplies that has a second port here, if you get a special cable, which I know we have a few at school so I'm going to take one home, you get a special cable and you can hook your monitor directly to the power supply. Um, it is my assumption that this is simply a pass-through. The power comes in through here and comes out through here. This doesn't actually come from the electronics of the power supply. It's simply a pass-through from the outlet. So, we have an AT keyboard port. This is why I could not uh, use this thing when I brought it home yesterday. I did not have an AT keyboard and I don't have an AT to PS2 adapter. So obviously, I needed to get an AT keyboard, and well, because I'm such a logical person, I did. This is an Acer AT keyboard. There's what it looks like. Flip it over here. Ugh. This is an Acer model 6011, made on August 8th, 1991 in Malaysia. There are two of these keyboards in school. The other one's a PS2 one, which Brandon took home. And the reason he took it home is the reason I took this one home, besides the fact that I needed it for this computer. This is literally the best keyboard I've ever used in my entire life. And I've used an IBM Model M, and that's a great keyboard. But this thing, the typing feel, is just unreal. It's just so freaking loud. It feels so good to type on, it's so, there's such responsive feedback, it's better than the Model M at school. Yeah, if, if I could ever recommend a keyboard for someone who needs something that feels really good to type on, it would be this. And then after this, the IBM Model M. 
But then again, the Model M has that curved design too, so I suppose in that case the Model M would be just as good as this. But this is the best, in terms of typing feel, this is the best keyboard I've ever, ever used. And it's got a power light on it, that's pretty cool. So yeah, I brought home this keyboard. I did use this computer at school. I plugged it in and powered it on. And after sorting out the BIOS because the battery was dead and it doesn't auto detect the hard drive. So I had to program the hard drive in, tell it to detect the hard drive. And it booted into Windows 95 and worked absolutely perfectly. So this thing does work perfect. So of course we have an AT keyboard port. We have two serial ports, a DB9 and a DB25. I've never seen that before, that's pretty awesome. A parallel port, and then we have our video card, a sound card, and a modem. And now, allow me to raise my seat. And now we'll take the cover off with one hand, hopefully. Okay, and here's the inside of this thing. The CD-ROM drive is an Acer CD910E 10X, made in September 1996. The power supply is a Perfection Technology Company Limited model HS250. I've never heard of that power supply brand before. So that's kind of interesting. I assume it's 250 watts. I haven't done the calculations, but going by the model number, I'd say that's what it is. The fan likes to rumble sometimes, so I'm going to take this power supply out sometime and oil the fan. We have, this is wonderful, there's date codes on everything here. So it's it was no trouble at all to date this computer. The date on the power supply is July of 1996. Now... Before I go further, I meant to say this near the beginning of the video, but I believe this is quite literally the perfect computer for a DOS or Windows 3.1 hobbyist. I think this is a perfect computer given its specs. Um, the AMD AM5X86 is a 486 class processor, uh, despite its name. It's called the 5X86 because it was meant to give uh, Pentium-like performance, but it is a 486 class processor, the most powerful 486 class processor ever made, or I should say the second most powerful, because there was a 150 megahertz version, but it's not very common. But this is 133, which is a very powerful 486. It's equivalent to a 75 megahertz Pentium. And there's the CPU. It's a socket 3. Socket 3 there which is good for an Intel 8486 DX2, DX4, uh, a 5x86 from AMD or Cyrix, and it will take a Pentium overdrive. So if I wanted to, I could upgrade this thing to a real Pentium, and then I'd be able to run software that required a Pentium, such as Windows XP, if I so dared to do so. But a tiny cute little heat sink and fan, the fan itself was a bit rumbly, so I oiled it. It's very good now. I'll take the uh, I'll take the heat sink off and show you the processor. Give me a minute. Advanced Micro Devices AM5X86 P75, meaning it was equivalent to a 75 megahertz Pentium in terms of raw performance. Although, if you wanted to run Pentium software, you couldn't, because of course it's just a 486. Uh, X5 133 ADW 1996, the 37th week, 3.45 volt heatsink and fan required, designed for Microsoft Windows 95. And there's the underside, and it's in this black thing for the fan. There's your socket 3, and you know, these were beautiful processors. I mean, the reason these were so beautiful was because these were made at a time when the Pentium was still a new and very expensive processor. And these were quite cheap processors. And a cheap processor, you know, a cheap 486 that provided the performance of a Pentium, that really appealed for the masses. And these were just overall beautiful processors. Some people say this is one of the best processors AMD ever turned out. So we'll... Bring that right back home. If I can 
get it in the holes right. There we go. Just like that. And the heat sink slips in. Well, sometimes it likes to slip in. Just like that. So, moving right along. The parallel and serial ports, they connect directly to the motherboard. I know on the back it looks like they're on a card, but they're not. Now, another reason that I think this thing makes such a beautiful uh, computer for the DOS or Windows 3X hobbyists is that it has both PCI slots and ISA slots. And it even has a freaking Visa slot. Now, for those of you who don't know, Visa was a pretty unpopular standard that came about before PCI. It was basically the predecessor to AGP because it was designed, although several types of cards were made for it, it was meant for video cards, high-performance video cards. And it was invented because it was a 32-bit bus where, of course, ISA was only 16-bit and video cards were becoming powerful enough that they began to saturate the bandwidth of ISA. So, what they did was they made a new standard that was 32-bit for video cards, allowed for faster video cards to be made. And, uh, if you wanted to, which the builders of this computer did, you can use it as just an ISA slot because all Visa is, it's ISA with this piece here uh, to extend it to 32 bits. So uh, this is in use as an ISA slot. We have an ISA modem here. It's a Connexent modem and I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or what, but all the date codes of which there are several that I find on this card date it to be made in the middle of 2000. And that just makes no sense because it's, I haven't heard of any ISA cards made in 2000. So if someone can, you know, if one of the older viewers of this video could help me out here, could this modem really be made in 2000? Because personally, I highly doubt it. We have a sound card, an ISA sound card. It's an analog devices sound card. And then the video card, it's a PCI video card, but it's not the original, the original PCI video card is right here. Here's the original PCI video card. It's a Cyrus Logic, upside down. It's a Cyrus Logic GD5446 PCI video card. Um, I swapped it out for the card that's in it now, which is an ATI Mach 64, the last non-3D accelerated video card ATI ever made. The reason I switched the video cards is, well, I was going to do it anyway, because I'd rather have an ATI video card than a video card from Cyrus Logic. Probably higher performance, too, but the thing is, when I brought this computer home, one of the first things I did was I took all the cards out of it, took the computer outside, and blew it out, because it was really, really dusty. And I brought it back in and put all the cards back in it, and the thing wouldn't turn on. I pressed the power button and the lights and fans would come on and that was it. So I did some troubleshooting and in the end, removing the video card allowed it to boot. I put this video card back in and it wouldn't boot anymore. So I don't know what happened. I mean, this thing's working fine now with that ATI Mach 64, but it won't work anymore with this Cyrus Logic card. So I don't know if I did something to break this card or what, but all I know is this card is not working anymore. It worked before I took it out, but now that I've taken it out, the freaking computer won't turn on anymore. So, who knows? Uh. Yeah, da -da -da -da. There is a floppy controller and an IDE controller built onto the motherboard. Uh, two IDE buses. So, there's one going to the hard drive, which, by the way, the hard drive, I don't know if you can see it. Uh. Gosh, this thing's big. The hard drive is, you see part of it right there. You might be able to see it through the holes. There we go. You can see it's a Seagate. A Seagate ST31276A. 1.2 gigabyte IDE hard drive. And it's working fine. I haven't tested it yet for bad sectors because I haven't been able to use this computer yet because I just got that keyboard now. But uh, 
it booted fine into 95, so I assume the hard drive is fine. I have this exact hard drive in my collection that I got from school. But, uh, that's tucked away in there, and then this thing is on its own IDE channel. Down there you see the AT keyboard connector. And of course, this is an AT power supply, so instead of the one 24 pin connector, 20 or 24 pin, there are two separate connectors, probably labeled P8 and P9, which is what the old AT motherboards used. Now, now I'm gonna tell you why this thing is just so darn quirky. The motherboard in this is a motherboard very similar to that of UXW Bill's computer. UXW Bill's computer, almost exactly like this, has a PC chips motherboard. Well, this is also a PC chips motherboard. It is in fact a PC chips model M919, a board that was made throughout 1996 and early 1997, meant as a extremely cheap board, as in probably the cheapest board you could buy in 1996, which is no surprise because PC chips always made very, very cheap stuff. Now, by cheap, I don't mean just inexpensive, I mean cheap. Where do I start? Well, this motherboard, like UXW Bills, does have fake cash on it. You might be able to see... Get the flashlight. Where'd it go? Aha. Uh -huh. Right there, you see two integrated circuits might be able to see that one there says right back on it that's what both of these chips say they both say right back which makes it seem like they are level 2 cache for the CPU but I already knew this but I looked it up and had no trouble finding this information as well those chips are fake they are empty pieces of plastic glued to the motherboard that is literally fake cache that PC chips went into the trouble of putting there to make this seem like a better bargain than this motherboard really was. This motherboard retailed for about $80 back in the day when higher quality motherboards retailed for $150 or more. But uh, that is indeed fake level 2 cache. This motherboard has no level 2 cache, which really defeats the purpose of the wonderful AMD 5x86, a very high performance 486 processor, because it is not high performance because it has no level 2 cache. The only thing that saves this from being a dog is that this processor has a very large 16 kilobyte level 1 cache, and that's what saves it from being, you know, slow as a 386. But, uh, no level 2 cache, at least they give you a slot here. To install a level 2 cache and there used to be these modules back in the day that you could buy for 40 or 50 dollars called coast modules coast stood for cache on a stick and you would buy those and you would install them and you would have level 2 cache I've seen one computer besides this I've seen one computer in my entire life that actually had a coast module installed and it was actually a Pentium 4 system but uh Here's the thing though, that is not, sorry for misleading you, that is not a coast slot. It is a level, it is a slot for level 2 cache, but it is not compatible with coast modules, which were common back in the Pentium days. If you put a coast module in that, you'll blow your power supply. It's a different type of level 2 cache on a stick called an asynchronous a, a, asynchronous module or something like that that are not very common to find I'll probably never find one and this board will probably never have level 2 cache oh well so that's the first quirk with this motherboard no level 2 cache uh, the second quirk actually you know what I just might uh, let the second quirk uh, display itself by powering this thing on so let's go over there hook this thing up and for the first time since I've brought it home, power this thing on and explore it. I have formatted the hard drive so it's completely blank, it won't boot, but we will go into the BIOS. Ah, that, that's, that's the second quirk is the BIOS. That's a really cool quirk. If you've seen UXW Bill's video, you know what I'm talking about, but I'll show you right now. 
Even though this computer doesn't have an operating system right now, I'm going to hook a mouse up to it, and you'll see why in a minute. And to hook a mouse up to it, of course, it needs to be hooked up to the serial port. So I have this Microsoft Serial to PS2 adapter, so I can hook up a PS2 mouse and I'll be able to use it. I do have a serial mouse, but it doesn't work very well. I should throw it away. I forgot to mention one more thing. I did replace the CMOS battery in this computer. Uh, the one in it was dead. Luckily, it's just a plain old lithium CR2032 battery. And the old battery fared fine. It wasn't leaking, so everything's fine. I just replaced it with a new battery. As a matter of fact, it was the battery out of the Dell Inspiron N4020 that died. All right, we have the power and the monitor hooked up. The AT keyboard hooked up and a mouse hooked up to the serial port. So without further ado, we will turn this on. I'm going to try and get a better view of the monitor here. Now, when I turn this thing on, it's going to emit a pretty frightening buzzing noise. But don't fret and please, God, don't crap yourself because that buzzing sound is good. It's checking the memory. That's what causes that buzzing sound. So let's go right now. And those two beeps are good as well. And look at that. Oh, our monitor's kinda, huh, never done that before. I guess we gotta readjust our monitor here. Good. So here we are at the uh, post screen. It's an American Megatrans BIOS, copyright 1994. Energy Star. The BIOS is dated the 6th of March, 1996. 16 kilobytes of RAM. Okay. CMOS. System options not set. CMOS display type mismatch. Run setup utility. Press F1 to resume. And the power light on the keyboard's on. Now let's press F1 and let me show you just what the BIOS is. Once again, if you've seen UXW Bill's video, you know already what this is going to be. This is the BIOS setup screen. It's called the AMI Win BIOS, and this was pretty much the very first graphical BIOS interface. Unless IBM did it before, but I don't think they did. But uh, yeah, this is a graphical BIOS setup, and of course, it's made to look like Windows 3.1, hence the name Win BIOS. Now I'm going to take this opportunity to adjust the monitor a bit more because it's still quite a bit off. I don't know why. Maybe just where it's a different video card. It appears that the ATI Mach 64 works just fine though. That's wonderful. Of course, you can see we have a 90 on the display. That means 90 megahertz. And if we press the turbo button, ah, you can also see the hard drive lights on. I don't know why though because it's not accessing the hard drive. I hope I haven't hooked something up backwards. I don't think I have though. And of course the power lights on. That's another cool thing about this computer is just the lights on it. It just looks so cool. Green power light, red hard drive light, and if we press the turbo button, we get a yellow turbo light and it changes to 133. So now we're running at 133 megahertz. Now I finish that sentence with an asterisk because I'll tell you why later. Right now let's fiddle around in the BIOS. In fact I I genuinely have to fiddle around and set it up because I changed the battery. Now, um, hmm, another feature about the Win BIOS that I was gonna surprise you with was that it's supposed to be compatible with a mouse, but it is not working. Oh, look at that! Our serial mouse fell right out. Let me, let me plug that back in. Okay, I made sure the mouse was plugged in securely this time. Let's try it again. Good. You heard the classic Seagate seek test when the hard drive spun up. Okay, we're not getting a mouse. I thought UXW Bill said it does support a mouse. Hopefully it doesn't mean there's something wrong with my serial port. It did work fine uh, back when this thing had Windows on it before I formatted it, but let's just navigate through the keyboard. 
and see what we have here. Going to fix the white balance. There we go. It's a very nice looking interface. Date and time. Let's go ahead and set that. It's April the 26th. Tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, is my 18th birthday. And it is 2012. A great year indeed. Hopefully this bio supports it. Thursday. Good. Enter. Good. Floppy A is indeed a 1.4 megabyte. Floppy B is not installed. Master disk. It says not installed. We have to tell it that something exists. Probably... Oh crap. There used to be... There used to be an auto detect. I think that's on another page. Because I remember I had to auto detect the hard drive. And then the slave disk. I remember in the beginning it said not installed. So I'll just leave it at that. Although I don't know if it's right or not. Because the CMOS battery was dead after all. So we got that much. Let's go into advanced. Uh, what's this? I don't know. System keyboard, present. No, it's absent. That's how I'm configuring this. <laughs> VGA. Okay. Above one megabyte memory test. Uh, let's enable it. Just for diagnostic reasons, make sure everything's fine. Memory test tick sound. Ah, that is the buzzing sound. And I might actually disable that later because that is a pretty nerving noise this thing makes when you turn it on. Hit delete message display enable, extended BIOS RAM, yada yada yada. Wait for F1 if any error, system boot up, no lock. Floppy drive, seek at boot. Let's enable that. By the way, Back at school, I did boot this to a floppy disk. This thing has the coolest sounding floppy drive I've ever heard. It's uh, It makes a higher pitch stepper motor noise than what I've ever heard from a floppy disk. Um, and plus, the mechanism's just, I don't know if it's dirty or worn or what, but it's quite loud too, and it just sounds really cool when it's loading DOS from a floppy. Um, what other options do we have here? Floppy drive swapping, I don't know what that is. Alt-H is help. And that tells me nothing. Ah, wait a minute. It does support a mouse. So why isn't it showing up? System boot up sequence, aha. Uh -huh. And the CD-ROM drive isn't there, so maybe this doesn't even support booting from a CD-ROM. If it doesn't, that's going to be... Well, no, it won't be a big hassle, because I'll just get a DOS floppy that supports CD. Um, floppy drive first. External cache. Now here's the thing. Remember I said that this has no level 2 cache. Well then you're asking why does it have the option in the BIOS? PC chips literally hack the BIOS to make it think there's a cache. And they let you set the option. Even though it doesn't exist. Password checking. Yeah. Video window, shadow, I don't know what this stuff is. I can configure a Cisco router, but I don't know what this shadow stuff is. And I guess that's it. Chipset. Auto configuration. Ah, oh, look at this, look at this, look at this. Level 2 cache mode. Right back or right through. Oh my goodness, it even has a... Oh, that's funny. Then again, this probably applies to if you have a uh, cache card installed too. Power management. Huh. Does support power management. That's funny. We'll set it enabled just to see what happens. Ah, okay. So it's not from the operating system. It's it's controlled by heart by uh not hardware but firmware. Hmm, interesting. I might actually leave that disabled. Peripheral. Onboard floppy disk controller enabled. Serial port, yes, yes, parallel port, parallel port mode, I believe, it should be either EPP or ECP, I think, but I'll just leave it as it is, onboard IDE enabled, IDE mode, let's put auto, because I think, I think the hard drive's mode 4, 
That's the mode is just the speed that it operates at. PCI secondary IDE enabled. Cool. Ah, auto IDE. This is where it detects the hard drive. There we go. So now the hard drive is working. Color set. Oh yes, UXW Bill played with this. He set it to pastel, I believe. Woo! I'm happy with just the default LCD. <laughs> Password, anti, ooh, antivirus. I'll just leave it disabled. For complete virus protection package con... Oh my goodness. Huh, that's funny. Thanks for that AMI. Default. Original or optimal. Okay. We are going to save changes and exit. Cool. Okay, main processor, AMD 5x86. It has a math coprocessor built in, 1.4 megabyte floppy, BIOS state, 101094, there's the hard drive, 16 megabytes of RAM, yada 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 yada. Valid system disk, replace the disk and press any key. <laughs> right back cache on, 133 megahertz CPU clock. Yeah, right. PC chips really went out of their way to uh, to make this thing seem like it has cash even though it doesn't. I think it would have been cheaper on their part and save a lot of time just to put cash on the darn thing. But anyhow, now I'm going to take this opportunity to explain another quirk that this thing has. Now, the turbo button does appear to work. You know, switches between 90 MHz and 133. Now, but here's the thing. If you look, you're going to have to take my word for it because I know you can't see much through that jumble of wires, but here's the thing. Right down there are two pins to which a turbo switch is supposed to connect. There is no turbo switch connected to those pins. When you press the turbo switch, I trace the wires coming from the turbo switch. The wires coming from the turbo switch connect directly to the LED display. That's how it's hooked up. I don't know if that's the way it's supposed to be or if it's fake, but all pressing the turbo switch does is change the display. And as a matter of fact, pay attention to the segments. If I hold the turbo switch halfway in between the positions, those light up, and those are the common LEDs between 133 and 90. All pressing the switch is doing is lighting up and disconnecting the proper LEDs to switch between the numbers. What do I mean by this? The turbo switch is fake. It does absolutely nothing. Now, like I said, there are pins for a turbo switch on the motherboard, but nothing's hooked up to them. But, in addition, there is, I think that's it right there, there's a, oops, there's a little thing right there that says turbo switch. That is supposed to connect to the pins there to give turbo function. So, while this thing does not have an actual functioning turbo switch, I think it does have the potential to have one. I'm going to experiment sometime and connect that connector to the motherboard and see if I actually do anything. But Now if I turn the turbo off and reset the computer, See, it still says 133 megahertz. So, anyhow, turbo switch. I mean, it certainly looks cool, and that's good enough for me. But, uh, it would be nice to get it functional. So, I'm going to do some experimenting later. Don't know why the hard drive lights solid on, but I do hear the hard drive look for an operating system. So, I'm going to assume everything's hooked up right. So, until I get an operating system on this, that's pretty much all there is to show of the MCA Turbo 486. So, I'll tell you what I plan to do. First of all, I'm going to switch out that analog device's sound card for a much better sound card. As a matter of fact, 
uh, in many people's opinions, the best ISA sound card ever created. I got, from school, a Creative Labs Sound Blaster AWE64 ISA sound card. Now I'm going to replace the analog devices card that you see before you with that Sound Blaster. And then this thing will have an awesome video card, or an awesome sound card, excuse me. And that modem, I have no use for a modem, so I might find an ISA network card among the piles of junk at school and replace it with that. I know there's a quite a few uh, 3Com Etherlink 3s, or I think those are PCI, but I know there's a few ISA network cards that I'm going to replace that modem with. And other than that, I want to get an operating system on it. It doesn't seem like that this can boot from a CD drive, so I'm going to have to rig up a uh, MS-DOS floppy with CD-ROM support. As a matter of fact, my custom-made boot disk that I made when I was 12 years old does have those drivers on it, so that'll work. I want to put Windows 3.1 on this, assuming it'll work perfect and will be compatible with all the hardware, because I want to turn this thing into the best darn DOS and Windows 3.1 machine ever. So I think what I'll do is... I'll, uh, I'll get Windows 3.1 running on this. I might actually do a dual boot with Windows 95. And uh, until then, that's pretty much all there is to show of this computer in this video. Really happy to have something like this. I've always wanted a computer like this. I love that LED display. But uh, until next time, there's the MCA Computers Turbo 486. I'll boot up into uh, Kill Disk so you can hear what the floppy drive sounds like. It's pretty awesome.